So the way that we approach science and, and, and probing the human brain is, is through experiments where we look at conceptual experiments in neuroscience. So, for example, there's the rubber hand illusion, if you probably know that. Lay it out and Lay explain it, out. it to people. So the rubber hand illusion is this illusion where you have um, a chap, he puts his hand right here, um, and then you have his right hand underneath the table, right? And so me, Balan, the experimenter, will stroke and tap the hand of the, exp uh, the, the sub experimental subject. I'll go stroke, stroke, tap, tap, st tap, tap, stroke, stroke underneath the table. And I'll stroke and tap the table in front of Joe, the, the subject. I'll go tap, tap, stroke, 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 tap, tap. And about I mean, two minutes of me doing this, he will feel touch sensations arising from the table. And I don't mean this in kind of uh, an abstract metaphorical sense. I mean this literally. He will have uh, touch sensations, somatosensory regions of his brain becoming active from this process. Yeah, well, that's a very strange element of human perception, right? It, it must be strongly associated not only with our ability to map sensation onto our bodies, right? but also with our ability to use tools. So Absolutely. I know, for example, we're very good at it. Like if I pick up a screwdriver, right. it takes me virtually no time to use the tip of the screwdriver yep. in a manner that very much approximates the tip of my finger. Right. right. And then when we go in a car, mm -hmm. essentially what we're doing, especially once we're expert drivers, is that we expand the dimensions of our kinesthetic perception, our right. bodily perception, mm -hmm. to include the car, right? right? So you're feeling with the tires, you're feeling with the yep. brake, yep. Yep. right? And, and that's, well, it, my, part of my understanding of that is that that's very tightly associated with our tool using, tool using proclivity, because a tool is a bodily extension. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's an embodiment, right? So in two minutes, I, I turn this, this, this subject into a table, right? And then more than that, if I, me, you know, Baland was to a take a hammer and go like this on the on the table, he'll go, you know, he'll feel pain sensations, right? So the pain regions of the, his brain will light up if I was to look in a scanner and, and you know, look at, it, at the neurons there. So, so it shows you that in that way you can take something, you can, first of all, you can create a sensation of a of a this table belonging to you, but then being after, part of you, big part of you, right? Yeah, it becomes yeah. an embodied part of you. Yeah, yeah. But then yeah. beyond that, you you yeah. afflict pain now to the person to, to the table, in fact, and then you will feel. Yeah, well, that would all well that would also be part of social perception. I right. presume. I read a paper not not long ago. If I remember the details carefully, they were looking at the difference. Either I think it was I think the dimension was agreeableness, right. but it might have been psychopathy, right. um, which would be the opposite of agreeableness. Right. Let's say that more agreeable people, so less psychopathic people, feel have more pain activation to the perception of other people's pain. Right. So you could imagine that part of the utility in being able to morph your pain sensitivity, even to represent something objective like a table, right. That's also a variant of my ability to map my own body, let's say, onto your body, so right. that the empathy that I feel for you isn't conceptual. Right. It's a, and I've really been I've really been thinking about this in terms of how we understand each other because mm -hmm. it looks to me like what we do to understand each other is I notice what your aim is partly right. by watching your eyes. Right. I infer your aim. Mm -hmm. Once I infer your aim, I can inhabit your perceptual space because if I know your aim, I know the objects that surround you. But I also know how your emotions are configured right. because they're configured in relationship to the aim. Yeah. If I can adopt that aim, then I can embody those emotions right. and perceptions. Right. Right. I can read off that embodiment and then I, that's, so the understanding is actually my simulating you on my own neural architecture. Right, right. And then, drawing the appropriate inferences from that. And it looks to me like children probably develop that ability. Some of it's nascent, I would say. Some of it's there. It's very interesting. So we actually, we were the first group to show that people with OCD, who has a very fixed sense of self, right? So they wash their hands all the time, washing and scrubbing. When they do this illusion, they have a much more sensitivity to it, to the extent that there's a control condition for this illusion, where you, so the, so the illusion, for the illusion to occur, you have to stroke and tap, 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 stroke, and stroke, and tap in a synchro synchronized manner. That's right. very important, right? So the, that's 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 key. Right. So you're linking the visual perception to the kinesthetic perception? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, right? 
But in people with OCD, so the control for this, by the way, is if you do it in a random sequence, like tap, tap, stroke, stroke, but everything is just random, right? And you do, again, the touching and stroking is random, then the illusion will not occur or it will be slightly. So you'll have a slight uh, illusion there or most of the time, no illusion. That's So this is the key control for the for the illusion. Right, so let's just walk through this so everybody understands right. clearly. So you have someone with their arm on a table, let's say, their yeah. left arm. Yeah. Their right arm is under the table. Yeah. So they can no longer see it. Yep. Now, what you're doing then is you're you're interacting with their hidden arm physically. Mm. Physically, and yep. at the, so But they can't see that. They, they can feel it. it. Yeah. At the same time, you interact with the table yes. where they can see it. Absolutely. So you're syncing their visual perception mm -hmm. with their kinesthetic perception. Absolutely. But it's not but their kinis or their visual perception isn't focused on their own hand. Right. Now they start to react to the table like it's a hand. Correct. Okay, now you're extending this to the OCD situation. Yes. Okay, yes. so elaborate on that. Absolutely. And I just want to, just one uh, point here is that I mentioned a table. So the original experiment was done with a rubber hand, right? Right, right. right. But I'm, I'm using table because it's more, it illustrates the, uh, the experiment better, I think, and, and you can you can have a table as well. So right. I'll People would start responding to a rubber hand as yeah. if it was their own. So instead of a table, you just have a rubber hand that looks like your own hand, and then you stroke and tap the rubber hand right in front of the person. Right, with their the other hand hidden. Correct. They start to respond right. to the rubber hand as if it's theirs. Right, right, right. exactly. And then flinch if there's a threat to they it. They flinch if there's a threat to yeah. it, right? Okay. okay. So, and that can be extended to something as inanimate as a table. Correct. Right. Okay. Or in fact, in fact, you can do it in air. So Magna you do know Rich Magnelli? Oh, yes. Yes, yes, Some yes. A common friend, right? Yeah, Over yeah, at Harvard, yeah. right? So one day Magnelli and I did it in, in the air. So I did it on, on, on Rich call him Rich, so it's stroke, stroke, tap, tap in the air, and he felt the rubber, like a, his own hand was floating in the air. This is kind of spooky. So wow. He went, my God, what's what's happening? I feel my I feel my hand hand is floating in the air. 